and continuing with the fifth chapter of Dragons in the Waters by Madeline Lengel, which is called Nocturne. Simon undressed and brushed his teeth and drank a glass of ice water from one of the two thermoses which Geraldo filled morning and night. Cousin Forsyth had yet to come to bed. Simon knelt on his bunk and looked out of his porthole into the dark, into the warm dark sea and sky. The ocean was calm, and he could see starlight reflected in the water. They would be at Port of Dragons too soon for comfort, and Polly and Charles would be leaving, and he was homesick for them in advance, which in turn made him homesick for Aunt Leonis, for his small cupboard of a room and a wind stirring the Spanish moss and the live oaks, for old Boz and for the dragon who was a vegetarian and ate only Spanish moss. He sighed, pressing his cheek against the porthole frame and looking out to the horizon where sky and water mingled. The light breeze was wet and salty. He thought of being on the Orion without Polly and Charles and unaccountably shivered. Am I moaning and groaning again? He asked himself, shook himself and then sang softly. I met her in Venezuela with a basket on her head. If she loved others, she did not say. But I knew she'd do to pass away, to pass away the time in Venezuela, to pass away the time in Venezuela. His mother had sung that song to him. Aunt Leonis had given him back the song by singing it too. At first, he had not wanted to hear it, but she had said, Don't put away things that remind you of your mother because they hurt, Simon. It will hurt much worse later on if you try to wipe out such memories now. I gave her a beautiful sash of blue, a beautiful sash of blue, because I knew that she could do with all the things I knew she knew, to pass away the time in Venezuela, to pass away the time in Venezuela. It still hurt, but it was a, bear, but it was a bearable pain, and it was, at this moment, more nostalgia than anything else. The song was Aunt Leonis's song, even more than his mother's, because it was Aunt Leonis's long before Simon was born, who had taught it to his mother. He lay down on his bunk on top of the sheet. Cousin Forsyth still did not come, and he felt it would be discourteous to turn out the overhead light, let Cousin Forsyth fumble in the dark. It was hot, almost as hot as the summer at Pharaoh. A sadness surrounded him like the breeze, a sadness which had nothing to do with reason, he thought of going to Polly's cabin and knocking and asking if he could come in and talk for a few minutes, but she had said she wanted to finish the book. Nevertheless, he stood up and pulled on his warm seersucker bathrobe. He left the cabin and went past the galley, through the foyer, and down the starboard passage. He paused at Polly's cabin. The door was open, and he could see the light through the flowered curtains, but somehow he hesitated to go in uninvited. He went on past Mr. Theo's cabin, out onto the back deck, and up the steps to the upper deck. Here he stood between the rail and one of the lifeboats. He remembered the captain's warning and stepped back slightly, but the sea was calm and was moving with very little roll, and as long as he kept one hand lightly on the rail, he would be perfectly safe. The old song kept going around in his head. When the moon was out at sea, when the moon was out at sea, and she was taking leave of me, I said, cheer up, There'll always be sailors ashore in Venezuela, sailors ashore in Venezuela. The melody was minor and haunting and reminded him not of Venezuela, which he still had never seen, but of South Carolina. All those generations ago, the land around Pharaoh reminded Quentin Fair of Venezuela. And perhaps Simon would feel a flash of recognition when he stepped on Venezuelan soil, but now he imagined only a small, comfortable stack, comfortable shack protected by, live, by oak trees hung with moss. He looked up into the sky, and the stars were so close and warm he, almost, he could almost feel their flame. The stars at home were clear, too, because they were not near any city lights. He moved within himself back in time, as he and Aunt Leonis had so often done before, now standing on the Orion, on the way from one world to another, he remembered the first days after his mother's death, days he had not thought of since the first year. But his pre-breakfast conversation with Mr. Theo, 
had for no explainable reason brought it all back. Neither Mr. Theo nor Aunt Leonis would want him to moan and groan, but he didn't intend to. But when a memory flickered at the corners of his mind, he had learned it was best to bring it out into the open, and rather than making him sorry for himself, it helped him get rid of self-pity. The time of his mother's dying had been a time of limbo. It was not until they left the cemetery that he realized completely that both his parents were dead and that he was starting an entirely new life with Aunt Leonis. After the numbness of shock had worn off, a strange irritation had set in. It was worse than moaning and groaning. The smallest trifle sent him into a rage. Soap slipped out of his fingers onto the floor. His socks wouldn't go on straight. Aunt Leonis overcooked the rice. He was furious with the soap, the sock, the rice, furious with Aunt Leonis. She remained patient and unperturbed. The humid South Carolina heat thickened and deepened, and although he was used to heat, and it had never bothered him before now, it added to his anger. There's no use going to bed. It's too hot. My head's as wet as though it's as though I've been swimming. Aunt Leonis looked at him quietly over her half-moon spectacles, put down her knitting. She was making him a sweater. Let's go for a walk. If there's any breeze around, we'll find it. But no breath of air was moving. The night sat shadows seemed a deepening of the heat. The stars were blurred. The Spanish moss hung limp and motionless from the trees. The old woman and the boy moved under the thick shade until they had left the trees and stood under the wet stars. Look at them, Aunt Leonis pointed skyward. They're all suns, sun after sun, and galaxy after galaxy, beyond our seeing, beyond our wildest conceiving. Many thousands of those suns must have planets, and it's surely arrogant of us to think of our Earth as being the only planet in creation with life on it. Look at the sky, Simon. It's riddled with creation. How does God keep track of it all? Maybe he doesn't, Simon had said. You're thinking perhaps that he didn't keep very good track of your mother and father? Simon made no answer. Aunt Leonis continued to look up at the stars. I don't know about you, Simon, but I get very angry with God for not ordering things as I would like them ordered. And I'm very angry with your parents for dying young. It is extremely unfair to you. They didn't do it on purpose, Simon defended hotly. They didn't mean to die. They didn't want to die. He was so deep in, reliv in reliving the events of that evening that he did not sense the dark presence moving slowly toward him. He heard only the old woman's voice. I'm aware of that, but it doesn't keep me from being angry, nor you. You've been angry all week, Simon, but you're taking it on the wrong. Th but you're taking it out on the wrong things. It's better to take it out on God. He can cope with all our angers. That's one thing my long span of chronology has taught me. If I take all my anger, if I take all my bitterness over the unfairness of this mortal life, I can throw it all to God. He can take it all and transform it into love before He gives it back to me. Simon dug his hands into his pockets. If he has all of these galaxies and all these stars and all these planets, I wouldn't think he'd have much time left over for people. The dark figure moved slowly, silently, closer to Simon. Unaware, Simon continued to look out to sea. He heard Aunt Leonis, her voice as clear in his memory's ear, as though she were present. I somehow think he does, because he isn't bound by time or quantity the way we are. I think that he does know what happens to people, and that he does care. Why did he let my father and mother die then? We all die in this life, Simon, and in eternity, sooner or later, doesn't make much, never mind. I don't want you to die, Simon said. The dark figure was nearly on him. Hands were stretched out toward him. One quick push would be all that was needed. Simon was standing exactly where the captain had warned them not to stand. From the shadow of the deck came another figure who grabbed the arm of the first. The first figure jerked away and turned with incredible speed to streak down the steps and disappear into the shadows. His pursuer, equally swift, leaped after him. Simon had heard nothing. He reached across the ocean to the woman who had given him life as much as she had borne him. I'm a very old woman, Simon, and in the nature of things I don't have a great deal longer to live. But I've already so far outlived normal life expectancy, and I'm so fascinated by the extraordinary behavior of the world around me and the more ordered behavior of the heavens above that I don't dwell over much on death. 
and I'm still part of a simpler world than yours, a world in which it was easier to believe in God. Why was it easier? Despite Darwin and the later pro prophets of science, I grew up in a world in which my elders taught me that the planet Earth was the chief purpose of the Creator, and that all the stars in the heavens were put there entirely for our benefit, and that humankind is God's only real interest in the universe. It didn't take much imagination and courage then as it does it didn't take as much imagination and courage then as it does now to believe that God has time to present it to be present at a deathbed, to believe that human suffering does concern him, to believe that he loves every atom of his creation, no matter how insignificant. Simon leaned against the guardrail, he whispered, Oh God, I wish I believed in you. So even at a distance, the old woman's influence worked on him. He sighed deeply. At the same time, he felt strangely relaxed, as though Aunt Leonis had actually been with him there on the deck. The breeze lifted, lightened, cooling him. He was ready to go back to the cabin. He felt no need whatsoever for any more moaning and groaning. Polly lay propped up on the pillows of her bunk. She liked tid the tidiness and snugness of her little cabin. It gave her a sense of protection and peace. She was finishing the last few pages of Withering Heights, and it was good to be in a warm place while she was feeling the chill wilderness of Emily Bronte's Yorkshire. The O'Keefe rhythmic knock sounded on her doorframe. Come in, Charles, she called, and he pushed through the curtains. Sit on the foot of my bed and wait a sec. I've just got two more pages. Charles sat, lotus-like, at the foot of the bed, but his face held none of the tolerant memories of a Buddha. When Polly closed the book with a long-drawn sigh, he said, Paul, do you think Cousin Forsyth likes Simon? He certainly overprotects him. But does he like him? Polly hesitated. Then she looked directly at her brother. No, I don't think he does. Does Simon feel it? Has he said anything? No, but Simon is not an idiot. If Cousin Forsyth doesn't like him, he's had lots more chance to sense it than we have. I don't think Cousin Forsyth likes children, period. As a matter of fact, I think he's a xenophobe. But how could anybody not like Simon? You like him because he likes you. Liking someone isn't a reasonable thing. It's a sense, like seeing and hearing and feeling. Polly nodded. Yeah, okay, pheromones. But I still think Cousin Forsyth doesn't much like anybody. Now that you've brought it up, Charles, I've had the feeling since the first night that he wishes we weren't on the ship taking Simon away from his watchful eye. You'd think he'd be grateful to us for getting Simon out of his way. He isn't. I know he isn't. What I want to know is why. A timid knock came on the doorframe. Polly called out, Who is it? Simon. Oh, come in, come in. Simon pushed through the curtains. I saw your light was on, and I heard you talking, so I thought maybe you wouldn't mind if I came in. Of course we don't mind, Simon. Have some bed, Simon perched on the edge of the bunk. This is the first hot night. It's really... This is, the, this is the first hot night, and it's really not hot. Not the way it gets in the, sum, in the summer at home. It was cold when we left Savannah, Polly said. That must be why we feel it. Benicide Island gets hotter than this, too, and so did Gaia. Charles asked, Simon, is anything wrong? Simon looked down at his bare feet. Cousin Forsyth would not approve and said, Nothing wrong. I was just going back into the past. Polly put her hand lightly on Simon's knee. We're going to miss you when we get off the ship the day after tomorrow. I don't even like to think about it, Simon said. Let's not, then. Let's just remember we have all day tomorrow to be together. Hey, Simon, do you like your cousin Forsyth? Simon did not answer. I probably shouldn't have asked. Oh, that's okay. I didn't answer because I don't really know. He keeps telling me that I'm like a son to him and how happy he is that we can be together, but I don't think of him as a father or even an uncle sort of person. And I don't think he really feels fatherly about me. So that's why I didn't answer. Aunt Leonis has never said that she feels like a mother to me, but I know she loves me. And I don't love her like a mother. I love her because she's Aunt Leonis. And I guess maybe I don't much like Cousin Forsyth. I feel that I ought to, but there's something I don't know, but I don't think I like him. There, Charles said, changing the subject in his own calm way. Speaking of special dreams, I had one last night. Simon turned and looked at him. It was a good one, Charles said reassuringly. 
It was one of those brilliant pictures with all the colors more alive than they are when we just see them with the awake eye. I think it must have been Dragon Lake. I'm going to check it out with Dr. Eisenstein sometime. I was looking at a great, beautiful lake with small grass roofed cabins up on stilts out in the water and a forest behind. And I saw a dugout canoe with two people in it. One was an Indian, a girl with huge velvet eyes and delicate features and skin that lo that lovely rosy bronze color. The other was a young man, not an Indian. In fact, he looked very much like you, Simon, except that he had dark hair and he was grown up. When I woke up, I thought that was Quentin Fa that was Quentin Fair. It was a beautiful picture, just one lovely flash, and then I woke up. It couldn't have been Quentin Fair, Simon said. Why not? Polly asked. After all, he was in Venezuela for a long time. He could perfectly well have gone to Dragon Lake at least once. But Simon shook his head stubbornly. There is a theory, Charles said dreamily, that somewhere in our universe, every possibility is being played out. I'm not sure that's a comforting. Th I'm not sure that's a comforting thought, Polly said. At that moment, there came a knock, and Dr. O'Keefe came through the curtains. Here you are, Simon. Your cousin Forsythe is worried about you. I'm sorry, Dr. O'Keefe. I was hot, and I went up on deck for a few minutes, and when I came down, I saw that Polly had a light on. That's quite all right, Simon, but maybe you should have told him. He wasn't in the cabin, sir, or I would have. Dr. O'Keefe looked at his watch. It's nearly midnight. Did you three know that? Heavens no, Daddy. Go to bed, Charles. Good night, Simon. Charles untwined his legs. I've been thrown out of better places than this. Come on, Simon. Dr. O'Keefe and the two boys left. Polly lay back on her pillows for a few minutes, relaxing, thinking. Then she turned out the light. Cousin Forsythe was holding out his pocket watch when Simon came into the cabin. The boy led... The boy let the scolding side of him off. The boy let the scolding slide off him, murmured courteous apologies, get into, got into his bunk, and turned off the light. But somehow... Cousin Forsyth had turned the evening sour. And we'll pause there. <laughs>